Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Coleman. My guest today is Jerry Coyne. Jerry is an evolutionary biologist and geneticist. He received his PhD from Harvard in 1978, after which he served as a professor at the University of Chicago in the Department of Ecology and Evolution for over two decades. His seminal work is on the speciation of fruit flies. He's also the author of two books, including Why Evolution is True, which is also the name of his blog, and Faith versus Fact. In this episode, we talk about the tension between evolution and the biblical origin story. Jerry goes over the basics of the theory of evolution by natural selection. We talk about sexual selection. We talk about the teaching of intelligent design in schools and how that compares to the battle over CRT in schools today. We talk about the attack on evolutionary psychology from the political left. We discuss epigenetics and the concept of intergenerational trauma. We talk about how humanity has evolved genetically in recent history. We talk about the consequences of birth rate differences between different groups of people. We talk about gender dysphoria and gender ideology. And finally, we talk about the unanswered questions that remain in the field of evolutionary biology. So without further ado, Jerry Coyne. Okay, Jerry Coyne, how are you? Fine, yourself? Good, good to have you on. Likewise. As I told you, I've been reading your blog, Why Evolution is True, for a long time, and I've really enjoyed it. And I imagine some of my listeners will be aware of you either from that blog or, um, or from one of your two books or appearances on other podcasts. But for those who aren't familiar with you, can you tell them a little bit about who you are, how you came to study evolutionary biology, and think about you know, evolution, the contest between faith and science, and uh, the other topics that you write about? Well, that's a lot of stuff. I'll just start off. Uh, as I told you before we went on the air, I was suffering from the residuum of a bad cold, so I may be a bit hoarse. <clears throat> but um, I'm an evolutionary biologist. My specialty is the origin of species, how new species form, the problem that Darwin Roach, but never answered in his book. Um, I'm retired now. I retired about seven years ago. And I've gotten more involved in politics, the ideology of science, and more general things. The usual route of a retired professor. Um, let's see, what else did you want to know? Um, how did I get started in evolution? As is often the case in science, it's a charismatic professor. In my case, I went to the College of William and Mary in Virginia, and the very first class on the fir very first day of college was biology one, but it was taught by an evolutionary biologist who was extremely charismatic. His name is Jack Brooks, and I think he's still alive. Um, and he just was very, I mean, he just drew you into the subject of evolution. He was a herpetologist, but he studied evolution. He described it in such an attractive way that I thought I wanted to learn more about it. Um, and I needed to take genetics because in order to do evolution properly, you need to know genetics. So I um, asked him if he could get me into the genetics class as a sophomore, which I wasn't really supposed to take until I was a junior. I took that and I became an evolutionary geneticist working with Drosophila, the fruit fly. And then I took a course in evolution, and by that time I was hooked. I mean, like most biologists, I went to college expecting to study marine biology. I think every biologist at some point in their life weighs the option of becoming a marine biologist because they picture themselves on the bow of a boat chasing whales, very romantic and stuff, but... There's not many jobs for marine biologists, and most of them are not like that. Mm -hmm. And I just got sidetracked with evolutionary biology. And I can remember the moment that I became an evolutionary geneticist. I was a junior, and we had this difficult problem of trying to figure out the genetics of a character in fruit flies in which their eyes that are normally red were white. And they just gave us two vials of flies, of white eyes and red eyed flies, and said, Well, figure out what the genetic basis of this is. So I crossed them together, and in the 
hybrids were red, pure red, but then you could cross the hybrids amongst themselves, producing what we call an F2 generation. And I got four eye colors, not just red and white, but red, bright orange, brown, and white. And I, cu I couldn't figure out, well, how do you, I mean, you start with two eye colors and you get four when you cross mm. them. And I was thinking about this and I remember sitting on the bleachers waiting for my swimming class and all of a sudden it came to me that there must be two genes involved mm. in this character one of them makes a red pigment the other one makes a brown pigment together they make the reddish brown eyes of the flies but you can separate them by doing crosses and then i further went on to test that hypothesis by localizing the two genes that i posited were doing this they're called brown and cinnabar by the way but it was just such a I mean, it was a flash of inspiration. That, and what I like about genetics is the results are so clean. Unlike ecology and, you know, um, many areas of evolution where they're highly speculative, genetics is a very clean branch. You get a result because genes are, you know, they're more or less fixed things on chromosomes. So that's how I get into my final study, which is the yeah. uh, evolutionary genetics. Um, in terms of you know creationism and religion, I can say it very shortly. I, my first job was at the University of Maryland, and I taught it in a classroom that it was overlooking the plaza in front of the biology building. And almost every day on that plaza, a creationist preacher would be standing there below my class, hollering out about you know the perfidies of evolution and how it's false and everything. And I occasionally stopped by and listened to the guy. And I realized, especially when I read the statistics, that most Americans don't accept evolution. In fact, only about 20% of them do accept it in the form that we teach it. About uh, 40 is that, is that, of them. Is that are still true? Is that still true? Oh, yeah. That... Every, every year or two, the Gallup organization mm. runs a poll. and they 20%? Yeah, so here's wow. the data, as I remember it last time. The question is, um, how did humans come to be? And the first option is humans were created 10,000 years ago in the form in which they exist today. That's straight mm -hmm. biblical creationism, and about 40% of Americans subscribe to that. That's mm -hmm. a lot, four in 10. And another 20-odd percent subscribe to the view that humans evolved, but God was behind the process. Mm. This is what we call theistic evolution, that there's a little nudge that comes in from the divine creator, and usually the nudge comes to create humans, which are regarded as some special. This is another religiously based view, theistic evolution. That's, I think, uh, about 22% of Americans accept that. And then the, and the other alternative is humans evolved naturalistically, which is happens to be the truth as far as we know it and it's what we teach our students and only 20 percent of americans subscribe to that view the rest of them don't you know have say don't know or can't answer so it's only really one in five americans accept evolution mm. in the way that it's taught in the schools and colleges which is a pretty frightening statistic and of course it's all religiously based um, none of the creationist organizations that I've dealt with or fought with are anything other than based on religion. I've only met one creationist in my life out of thousands that have not been motivated by religion to reject evolution. Mm -hmm. um, and that's David Berlinski, who identifies himself, I guess, as a secular Jew. I think he's a secret religious person. But I mean, you know, if you look at the bottom of the whole thing, all opposition to evolution in America and most other places derives from religious belief. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, the Quran, um, Judaism, all the Abrahamic religions say that humans are special, the special objects of God's creation and attention. So that got me to write my first book, which my first trade book, I'd written a a book on speciation for specialists before that. My first trade book was called Why Evolution is True. Um, stop me if I'm bored. No, no, no. It's it's all it's all good. Okay. I mean, well, when I started my, you know, any professor knows that when you're starting a 
introductory class, the first thing you do is read how other people teach that class. Uh-huh. And then you sort of make a gamish of the various ways they do it. And I decided that because I knew these statistics that most Americans reject evolution, I needed my students to know why evolution is true. I needed to start, I mean, you don't need to start a physics class by saying, well, this is how we know atoms exist, or Mm -hmm. this is how we know gravity works. But that's because most Americans already accept the existence of atoms and gravity. They don't accept the existence of evolution. So I decided, okay, if I do anything in this class, if I want my students to go away with any lesson that they'll keep with them, it has to be why scientists accept evolution. And so that's, I decided to teach the first three hours on that. And when I went to all the modern evolution textbooks, and I have a lot of them in my office, there's nothing in there about them. I mean, evolution is so widely accepted by scientists that we don't teach evolution by beginning to tell the students, well, this is why we think evolution actually exists. Mm-hmm. People just assume that. Yeah, But given that 80% of Americans or 78, 5% of them reject it, I think that you need to tell them that. In order to actually find out what the evidence for evolution is, you have to go all the way back to Darwin, 1859, to see what he proposed as evidence for evolution. And then you start looking at newer and newer textbooks. And in about the 1920s, when natural selection began to be accepted, that was the one part of Darwin's theory that was not widely accepted um, until the 20th century. And around 1920, people started realizing, yeah, Darwin's probably right about natural selection. They knew he was right about evolution. Everybody who had a brain accepted evolution in science by 1869. Can you just clarify the difference between evolution and natural selection? Yeah, so evolution is basically defined as genetic change in populations over time. Mm-hmm. So that's evolution in the technical definition, but there are several factors that can cause that change. The most important one, the one we know about, of course, is natural selection. And Darwin, in fact, suggested that. Um, It's even in the title of his book. But there are other mechanisms of evolutionary change as well. Um, One of them is called genetic drift, in which just random passing on of different gene forms from one generation to the next can cause a change in the frequency of genes over time. An example of this would be, for example, small human isolates like the Amish or the Dunkers, where they're inbred and they're small. And that smallness means that random factors play a larger role in which genes get passed on and which genes don't. And that's one reason why we see has such a high frequency of deleterious genes and conditions in small human isolates. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the, the Amish have a number of genetic diseases associated with them. Um, Ashkenazi Jews have Tay-Sachs disease and other diseases. So genetic drift is another form of that can change gene frequencies. There are other things as well, but they're trivial compared to drift and selection. Um, so you can have evolution without selection. That's the point I'm trying to make. Um, right. And we cannot assume if we see genetic change over time that it is due to natural selection. However, natural selection is the only evolutionary force we know of that can cause adaptive change in an mm-hmm. organism. That is the fit between the organism and the environment that we so admire and like to study the camel's hump, you know, the horns of animals, any trait that an animal has that helps it get along in its lifetime. Those things can only be installed by natural selection. So, right. Yeah. So, uh, so, uh, you know, during the Bush years, it was a big point of contention in, in politics that certain classrooms did not want to teach evolution. They wanted to teach so-called intelligent design. Has that battle been won in the American public school system? What's the state of that controversy? Good question. Um, yes. The answer, the short answer is yes. It was the uh, Dover versus Kitzmiller case. I think that was in 2005, but you can look it up, um, in which the Dover Area School District in Pennsylvania 
force the students to read a book on intelligent design as an alternative to evolution. It was called The Pandas and People, and it was produced by the Discovery Institute, which is the main headquarters of ID located in Seattle. Judge Jones, and it was a six-week trial. It was a big deal. It's a federal court. Supreme Court has never taken, well, it has taken up previous cases, but in this case, it was the ID, intelligent design issue at stake. And Judge Jones has issued this stinging 123-page opinion saying intelligent design was not science. Mm -hmm. And that cost the Dover Area School District over a million dollars in legal fees. <laughs> and so after that ruling, no school in the United States wants to touch intelligent design because it really almost bankrupted the school district. Mm -hmm. They had to lay off teachers and cut their budget and everything. And every school now knows and public schools are what we're talking about, the ones that are subject to the First Amendment. Um, they know that they shouldn't be doing this. So, no, it's not much of a problem anymore. But I also know that on the sly, biology teachers, particularly in the southern part of the United States, will slip in mm -hmm. ID or creationism. Now, the Supreme Court has never ruled on ID. I mean, Dover could have appealed that to the Supreme Court at the time. It was the liberal Supreme Court, and they would have um, upheld the design. But what I'm quite worried about today is the new conservative Supreme Court we have, mm -hmm. which has shown itself willing to take all kinds of bizarre stands, that they might somehow okay the teaching of creationism in some form or another. ID is creationism. They just don't identify the designer as God or Jesus or whatever. They just say, oh, it's some designer we don't know anything about, he, she, or that. But it's still religious. So, you know. It's interesting to me, uh, it's interesting to me to compare those debates during the 2000s about what could be taught in the classroom with debates going on today about what should be taught in the classroom. You know, today the arguments are about critical race theory and um, and and these kinds of topics and Republican states often have passed laws trying to delineate and write down and demarcate certain ideas that cannot be taught in a classroom. And um, there's been, you know, I've done, I think, more than one podcast about that issue with both proponents and, and critics of it. I'm curious to, to sort of compare these two cases. Like, is there something we can learn from how um, from how the the intelligent design debate was handled that can inform our uh, our principles on this issue of CRT today, or is it just too different to compare an, a hard science to a kind of wishy washy social issue like CRT and and race? Yeah, um, that's a good question. It's not easy to answer, mainly because I don't know where I come down on the issue of states telling schools what they can or cannot teach because they have a legal right to mandate curricula as far as I know. Mm -hmm. But what's happening in, you know, Florida and everything is that people don't know anything about CRT or just like they don't know anything about evolution are trying to dictate mm -hmm. what's supposed to be taught. On the other hand, you know, there's some sense, I think, and some of these bills, I just haven't looked at them very closely. But the difference between these ideologically based bills and evolution is that evolution is a scientific fact. I mean, no serious scientist takes issue with it. And virtually every serious scientist thinks that it's an integral part of biology education. So, you know, although I've heard that recently, I think it was one of the upper Midwestern states like Idaho or something had a bill in which evolution was going to be dissed somehow. It failed. It always will fail until the Supreme Court does it. Um, there's no, there's been no attempts to mandate um, the teaching of evolution because you can't mandate the teaching of evidence against evolution. So the difference between ideology on one hand and and science on the other is a matter of fact versus faith or politics on the other hand. Um, so, you know, 
the only lesson I can see is that states should not mandate what affects. Well, I mean, again, they can mandate what affects can be taught because mm-hmm. they're, they're, you know, some of these here, these bills say that you have to emphasize this about our history and you cannot say that indigenous people were, you know, badly treated or stuff like that. And we're, they're contentious issues, but there are some factual issues in there. So now I've stayed away from that debate because I don't know enough to weigh in on it, both about mm-hmm. the politics of dictating curricula and about how they're trying to change the curricula. But if they tried to mandate the teaching of something that was factually wrong, that's where science would come in and say, no, you can't do that. Right. So um, if you encountered someone that was skeptical of evolution, what would be your, you know, the two minute version of why evolution is true? That's another good question. <clears throat> first, the, my first thing to do would be to figure out if they're serious, if they really want to know why evolution is true, or they're just attacking me on religious grounds. Because one thing you discover very quickly as an evolutionist is that people that go after you as creationists are not interested in the truth. They are already brought up religious. They are propagandized to be religious from a very early age. You get your Jesus or your Muhammad or your Moses well before you get Darwin. I mean, as soon as you're able to speak, most people are propagandized into the faith of their parents. So most people that have accosted you with a question like, you know, why do you think evolution is true? I won't deal with them unless I think that they're actually open-minded and serious. Given that... That's our two minutes. <laughs> I mean, there are so many lines of evidence for evolution, the fossil record, biogeography, um, vestigial organs, etc. Each one of those is a chapter in my book that is hard to do. But if I were to concentrate on one thing, if I were to try to convince them in just a couple of minutes why evolution is true, I would line up all the human skulls from the earliest hominin known about four to five million years ago, Australopithecines, and just line them up in temporal order and say, okay, look at this. Now you tell me if this doesn't show this evolution. In fact, that's what the BBC did. They had a show called, uh, in which they flew about a dozen creationists from the UK to the United States. And then each one of us had a program on the BBC trying to convince these creationists to become evolutionists. My part was to try to convince them that the Great Flood didn't work. So they hauled us out in a boat in one of the lakes in the Grand Canyon, and I had a little model of the ark, and I tried to convince them that, you know, how's the, how are the kangaroos going to get from Mount Ararat in Turkey to Australia? <laughs> <laughs> Things like that. But it didn't work because religious indoctrination is so deep. If you let go of evolution, these people, for many of these people, you're letting go of your entire faith system, which Mm -hmm. the entire system that buttresses their well-being and their psychology. But what really did change their mind was when they went to Berkeley. And I'm not sure who the professor was, but he just lined up all those human skulls on a desk and said, okay, have a look at that. (laughs) <laughs> and it's indubitable. I mean, you see the brain case getting starting off really tiny, the size of a chimp. And over the, you know, five million years, it gets bigger and bigger. The brow ridges recede, the teeth get smaller, and it goes along with time very nicely. And that is what did change the mind of some of those creations. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I would try to do. It's hard to deny the fossil record. Or fossil intermediates. I mean, you could show them a half bird, half lizard, or half reptile, because it was thought that birds evolved from um, dinosaurs before we knew anything about that. And then all of a sudden, we started turning up skeletons of dinosaurs with feathers, like T. rex might have had feathers, for example. And the predictive ability to actually find missing links that were predicted, but weren't known is remarkable and it's Mm -hmm. hard to convince people who are creationists you know that this is evidence that god did it this way yeah (laughs) or something so so um so we've been talking about the skepticism of evolution from the political right from the christian right 
Let's now talk about the skepticism of evolution from the political left. Uh, in, in my view, there are people, you know, within academic institutions in academia on the left that would accept and happily agree with everything you've so far said, um, but essentially feel that evolution by natural selection has affected all of us up to the neck and then, you know, but has somehow managed to not affect our brains or, or somehow otherwise not managed to affect our, our personalities. So uh, they will resist very, uh, very doggedly the concept of evolutionary psychology, that our psychology, just like every other feature of us, is shaped by the genes that were successful in the past and adaptive to a human environment that by and large includes other humans as arguably the most important part of uh, one's environment. So uh, can you sort of summarize why people, especially academic progressives, are skeptical of evolutionary psychology and how you would persuade a skeptic? Yeah. Um, I'm glad you brought that up. I'm correcting the galley proofs of uh, a paper that I wrote with a co-author that's coming out in the end of June called The Ideological Subversion of Biology. It's embargoed now, but it takes five areas in my field, evolution, and showing how ideology is. Because he wrote in those areas, and one of them is the one you just mentioned, evolutionary psychology. We can talk about some of the others later if you wish. But, yeah, um, I'll, attacks on evolutionary psychology largely come from the left. They're, they baffle any real evolutionist because why should evolution have molded our bodies and our physiology and everything about us, but it left our brains intact? I mean, opponents of evolutionary psychology is simply the new version of sociobiology, which is, I mean, its tenet is that the human brain was molded by natural selection in the history of our species, and it still shows some of the selection pressures that acted on our brains during that time. Well, that's no difference in saying that it, that same thing happened to our body. The reason people don't like that, why they think that somehow our brains are impervious <laughs> to showing the traces of selection in our ancestors, is simply political. It's ideological. It comes from, I believe, the Marxist view that humans are infinitely malleable. And if somehow our brains are constricted by, and our behaviors are constricted by natural selection, then that makes us less malleable. It's part of a general attack on biological determinism that comes from the left. I'm not an expert on why that is, but the left is associated with these views of infinite malleability, mm -hmm. no differences between people, no differences between groups, complete biological equality, and that's manifested in this attack on the brain. Nevertheless, this view that evolutionary psychology is a bunk is probably false. I mean, in our paper, we go through a number of examples of human behaviors that, that show the selection pressures that acted on us when we lived in the savannah, and I only mention one because it's so bloody obvious to every human being that in general, not 100% true, men tend to be more desirous of having sex with women and as many women as they can than women are with men. In other words, men are profligate or promiscuous, you might say, and women are choosy. And this has been shown over and over again. Um, I think it's been shown in every human society that's been tested. Um, and the reason is, of course, because men don't have a lot to lose by mating with many women. And they have a lot to gain. I mean, look at Genghis Khan. Half the world is descendants of Genghis Khan because he was a big guy. And if you look at the... For example, the most profligate male in history in terms of children, I think it was a Moroccan emperor who had something like two, 3,000 children. I mean, then you look at the female <laughs> who had the most offspring in history. It turns out to be a Russian lady from the 18th century. She had, this is unbelievable in itself, about 70 kids. 
The wow. reason is that she had multiple births. What like a every hero. time she gave birth, she would have triplets. It must have been some genetic anomaly. But that difference between thousands versus 70 shows you the difference in the payoff to mating. A lot of times, if a woman mates twice within 24 hours, she's only going to have, at most, one offspring. If a man mates you know, twice within 24 hours and the women are fertile, he could have you know, two or more offspring. So this is this mold this is sexual selection. This molds this very obvious difference in sexual behavior that's conditioned so I mean it just permeates not just American society, but all societies interested in pornography between men, the fact that women are interested in stable males who are good providers, whereas men are interested in women who are in general youthful and have signs that they're gonna be good reproducers. Um that's just a result of evolution, you mm -hmm. know, and you can't deny it because it's true. I mean, yes, there are gay people that so, are attracted to their same sex, and but yeah. you know, in general, yeah. this is true. And it's all. Let me mention one more thing. Mm -hmm. This is not just true in humans; it's true in all animals. So to try to deny that it's a remarkable coincidence alone that in humans, men are promiscuous and females are choosy, but that also happens to be the case in almost every species of animal in the universe. Mm -hmm. It's all because of the same thing, sexual selection. And uh, so, if I, you'll, you'll know this obviously much better than me, but I remember some people came up with counter examples of species where the females were more promiscuous and sought out more partners than the males of that species as a rebuttal to evolutionary psychology. And then it turned out that the reason females in those species uh, were, were choosier is precisely because of this same point where in, in that species, the females happen to uh, have to invest very little. Yes. Into, so it's, it's actually not even really a point about males and females. It's a point, in, or at least it's not inherently about that. It's a point about which... Uh, which sex has to invest more by Correct. definition biologically in a given offspring, right? And yeah, whichever, right. whichever sex has, has to invest more ends up being the sex that is choosier. That's correct. I'm glad you clarified that. I mean, I use males and females as offhand for that, but there are these exceptions, one of them being seahorses. You probably know that. Hmm. The male seahorses invest more than the female seahorses in reproduction because they're the one that carry the eggs around. Mm -hmm. When they mate, the male fertilizes the female's eggs, but then he carries them around in her pouch. And he cannot mate again until all those eggs are hatched. In other words, the males get pregnant. Right. And they have a huge investment in those offspring. Females, on the other hand, they're like males in most species. They can go and inseminate another, I mean, not inseminate, they can go and give their eggs to another seahorse male. And they can produce eggs very quickly, but there are fewer males available for to hold eggs than mm -hmm. there are females willing to produce eggs. Mm -hmm. So, in that case, the male is the rare species, the one that has some great investment. And sure enough, in sea seahorses are exactly the opposite of most species in their ornamentation. And most species, like in birds and you know seals and everything, males are larger. They have bright colors they have dances mating behaviors they build bowers they have ornamentations this is all to attract the females and say mate with me mate with me well in seahorses because the males the situation is reversed it happens to be the females that are brightly colored and ornamented and trying to in you know say to the males mate with me you know let me take my eggs take my eggs mm -hmm. so, so it's the exceptions that prove the rule there and right you know, this is one reason why um, sexual selection has been such a powerful theory. Can you describe what sexual selection is? Yeah, sexual selection is just a basically, well, it's, a, it's just called a subset of natural selection. It's not something separate from natural selection, but it's a form of selection in which the environment itself has very little to do. I mean, the, you know, the cold weather and then you know the arctic makes the polar bear turn white i mean it's a selective pressure it gives it long fur transparent fur to soak up the sun in sexual selection on the other hand what molds characters is mate preference 
usually of females. Um, and so it's it's this interplay between males and females in the race to, to have offspring that causes traits. And in fact, this was first suggested by Darwin in 1871. In 1859, when he wrote On the Origin of Species, he hadn't thought yet about the effect that females being choosy would have on males and on the effect of males being promiscuous would have on both males and females. And it took him another uh, 12 years to work that out. I think in 1859, around then, he said, the thought of a peacock's feather, and he's referring to the males here, when I see it, makes me physically ill. Because he couldn't understand why males are brightly colored and females, peacocks, like most female birds, are fairly drab. It took him a long time to figure out. He got it wrong, sort of. He said that females have an aesthetic sense, and so they like the male peacocks simply because they're beautiful. Now we have other reasons. And sexual selection is still one of the great areas of biology that we don't fully understand because we don't know why females pick males that look certain ways or do certain things. Is it because yeah, so they have better why, genes? Why, they yeah. why, would, why would sexual... So this is just a it's just an interesting question to help highlight the concept and what makes it different from natural selection or or what makes it um worthy of its own name. Um why would sexual selection ever cut against natural selection? Like wouldn't it make the most sense that uh the females of a species would just prefer the men that are the most fit so that their preferences would neatly align with uh, the selection pressures of the environment. In, in what sense would it make sense for it to cut against, right? To have like a costly or weird trait. Well, that's a hard question. I'm not quite sure what you mean. In other words, there... let me well let me make it more succinct. Like, so let's yeah. say the, the peacock's tail makes him slower when running from a predator. And why, it does. Why might that still be in it? Why would the woman prefer? the the man that's the, the man that has the peacock's tail in that case because the peacock's tail signals something about that male that makes him give her more offspring than she would get by mating with another male even though a peacock with a bigger tail might survive less and this is one example where natural and sexual selection within a sex is opposing a male with a longer tail. I mean, peacocks are just horrible birds <laughs> in terms of survival. I mean, they can barely fly. They get wet and sodden. And it, it's a really sad sight to see a wet male peacock perching on a branch. They, they don't survive well. But what they do is they, they, they make their bones, i.e. leave more genes, by attracting more females to them. So although you lose some of your genes by cutting back on your survival with some of these onerous traits, growing long horns every year, and a moose is another one. Although you lose some of your um, reproductive ability by that, you more than make up for it by attracting females. So that's the reason it works. There is a constant playoff between what we think of as natural selection, which is fit to the environment, and sexual selection, which is attractiveness to females, and they can be in opposition to one another. But still, I mean, given that natural selection is defined as differential reproduction of genes, then sexual selection is natural selection. It's just natural selection for mate choice rather than natural selection to adapt to the cold or the drought or anything else. I mean, one of them... we. We usually think of natural selection as being due to the environment. Yeah. Yeah. So just just to quickly close that loop, when you say the peacock's tail might signal to the female something about the, the male's fitness, what might that kind of thing be? Would it be something like, wow, like this guy can survive with such a with such a huge, costly, impractical appendage. There must be something about him that is really noteworthy. Uh, obviously yeah, we're, we're anthropomorphizing peacocks here but is that the kind of yeah. thing that it might signal yeah um that's one of the theories that's called the good genes theory that a male that can grow a big tail obviously shows that he has genes that are good and therefore a female that picks him she's gonna 
her offspring will be carrying those good genes too. So she'll have male offspring that attract other females. And so it's, it goes on and on and on. But there are other theories as well. Um, here's another example of sexual selection that's probably not due to good genes. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it's, it could just be due to physical fitness, which may not have anything to do with your genes. Um, you know, you can be fit by running. There's all kinds of environmental modifications that can make you a fitter bird. If you're, if you have really good genes, but you get disease, then you're not going to be a good choice for a female because a, you're not going to take care of your offspring very well. And B, you could transmit that disease to your offspring. So the house finch is a good example of that. Female house finches go for males that have bright orange breasts and you can experimentally modify their breasts by painting them oranger and show that the females go for those males more. Why do they do that? Um, it's not necessarily because the males have good genes. It's because the more berries you eat, the oranger your breasts get <laughs> because you eat orange berries. And so it's a sign to the female that that male is in good condition. He's in good shape. He's well fed. He's going to be a good partner to help you take care of your offspring. Notice I haven't said anything about genes in that explanation. It's just basically based on fitness. Now that fitness could be connected with genes, but it doesn't have to be. There's not a perfect right. correlation between how orange you are and how good your genes are. So one of the great problems of biology that's remaining one of the great evolutionary problems is why do females choose the traits they do? You know, um, for example, the prairie chicken, the females all get around in a circle and the males hop up and down and boom, they're, you know, inflate their breasts. Well, you know, why do they choose the males? They happen to choose the males that jump up and down faster. You can show that, but why? It reminds me of, uh, it reminds me of one of my favorite quotes, which is women only want one thing and no one knows what it is. <laughs> <laughs> well that's probably true in sexual selection except that it could be that they want more than one thing but you still don't know what that is you know? <laughs> so you know there are a number of problems that are outstanding in biology and how sexual selection works is one of them mm. yeah. so uh i want to talk a little bit about epigenetics which is a a, f a field of of genetics that has gotten a lot of attention in the past five or six years and um it, it's basically you know it, it's promise is that events in my lifetime might change my gene expression um in in my gametes so that actual things that happen to me or things that i do in my lifetime might get passed on to uh, my offspring, which for a long time was viewed as, uh, you know, this is similar to Lamarckian evolution. It's really, it's not how evolution in general works. It's, I really just pass on my genes or, or so we thought, but the field of epigenetics has seemed to some to promise that events in my lifetime can uh, influence perhaps um, the, the genetic expression of my offspring. And some have taken this to be evidence that you can inherit trauma, for, for instance. You can inherit trauma from your ancestors, essentially. So do you uh, pay close attention to the latest consensus on epigenetics, on the, on the myths and, and the, um, the facts that this emerging field has established at this point? Yeah, I mean, I'm not an epigeneticist, but I do pay attention to the literature insofar as these people claim that this is a form of adaptive evolution that we that's completely anti-Darwinian. I mean, one thing about, I suppose, the ideological opponents to evolution that are not religiously based are that they don't like biological determinism. So this gives a way for the environment to change evolutionary pathway. Unfortunately, I mean, the one example you mentioned of inheritance of trauma, you're probably referring to like the Dutch famine study where the Dutch were starved, and I think when they were 42, and the offspring of those um, people were um, also underweight but also traumatized, and there is one generation inheritance of trauma. Well, that's not adaptive evolution. 
One thing you don't want to do is inherit trauma. Right. Because it's maladaptive. And that's the problem. There's two problems with epigenetics. Being touted as ubiquitous and being touted as another way of evolving. The first is that it's not ubiquitous. Um, not every evolutionary force is going to change your DNA. In fact, most of the changes of your DNA that happens epigenetically, usually by adding bits of chemicals to the DNA base pairs, you know, A, C, T, and G, are actually programmed in the genome itself. So epigenetics plays a huge role in development, for example. I and mean, we all start off with the genetically identical cells. Every cell in our body is genetically identical. But the reason that we develop a liver here and a heart here is because of different environments that turn on different genes in different parts of the body. And the, the way those genes are turned on and off in different parts is usually by epigenetics, that some genes are inactivated by bits being added to them and others are activated. Um, but that's in the DNA itself. So what I'm saying is that the DNA itself is coding for epigenetics. <laughs> It doesn't all come from outside the body. The DNA will say, okay, liver cell, I'm going to put a methyl group in this particular position at this time. And that makes the cell develop into a liver cell. So the DNA itself is programmed to use epigenetics as a way to affect development. This is the most important thing that epigenetics does. Um, but in terms of it coming from the outside to modify things, yes, there's evidence for that. Um, I think sensitivity to certain odors is also adapted. And there's a, a flower petal arrangement that has been shown to be passed on um, for a couple of generations. But the problem with epigenetics as a way of obviating normal Darwinian evolution is that most environmental things don't change your genes, don't have any epigenetic influences, don't influence your DNA. I mean, this is... Again, you said it's Lamarckian inheritance. Well, look at the kids of weightlifters. Are they born with huge muscles? <laughs> no, they aren't. So all this environmental stuff you do by lifting weights doesn't touch your DNA at all. you know. And most of the things that you do or encounter in your environment don't affect your DNA at all. So that's one thing. The other thing is that epigenetic modifications are almost all wiped out when a, the gametes are formed to make the next generation. So that's the main, another main reason why it cannot be a basis for a permanent change in a species or a lineage, because when DNA, when you're forming a sperm or an egg, there are mechanisms that wipe all that change out, and it has to happen because, you know, cells are epigenetically modified to be specific to their their tissues. You got to get rid of all that because you're going to produce a single cell that then has to go through that process of differentiation. So you got to get rid of everything that makes them differentiate when you start the next generation, which begins with a single cell. So most evolutionists see epigenetics as an interesting part of biology that we didn't know a lot about 30, 40 years ago, but they don't see it as overturning the dogma of of how inheritance or evolution works. There's just no evidence for that. People will use anecdotal observations and say, well, see, trauma can be inherited. But that doesn't mean that our brains got big from thinking <laughs> over the history of the human species. They got big because people that had bigger brains left more offspring, which mm -hmm. is straight Darwinian evolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so... For a long time, it was said that evolution has worked over very long periods of time, but not very recently, in the sense that there was no significant changes or evolution in the human species over the past, say, 500 years, or maybe even 1,000 years. Um, I've heard a lot of people you know, persuasively question that and point to certain examples of rapid evolution of evolution that's mattered over the span of the past 500 years or a thousand years, not just the past 50 or a hundred thousand. Have we evolved in recent human history? Yeah. Again, it depends on your definition of recent. I mean, if you're willing to extend it to say 20,000 years or 10,000 years, 
There's lots of evolution that we know about that's happened because we know what the human species was 10, 20,000 years ago. People crossed the Bering Strait about 20,000 years ago from Siberia into the Americas and then spread southward. That's not that long ago. I mean, 20,000 years is an eye blink in the history of the human species. Homo has been around for millions of years. Um, and yet, look at all the morphological evolution that has occurred in the new world. Um, you know, all the differences in the morphology of the different groups, the Mayans, the Aztecs, the Incas, and their differences from the Siberians that they came from in many traits, you know, body shape, size, skin color, et cetera, has happened in just the last 20,000 years. Now, if you want to go to more recent times, say 10,000 years, uh, we've seen, for example, the Tibetans have evolved the ability to bind oxygen to their hemoglobin more readily. There's a big paper by this. I can't remember the name of the woman who wrote it, but giving examples of evolution. Malaria resistance is another one in Africa. Sickle cell anemia is, in fact, an adaptation to malaria infestation it's just it's you know i mean it's hard to think of something as bad as sickle cell anemia being an adaptation sickle cell anemia is having two copies of a gene that in one copy protects you against malaria and unfortunately that's if you if that's the situation you're always going to get offspring produced that get two copies of the bad gene those are the ones that get sickle cell anemia and die but that's evolved you know, fairly recently, and it's evolved in the Mediterranean as well as in West Africa. Um, the Tibetans, as I say, there's cholera resistance. Um, there's a paper in Science which gives a number of examples of more recent human evolution. Humans spread around the globe not that long ago. Um, Have you heard of the, uh, the I may be mispronouncing, but the Bajau people? No. It's B A J A U. There's some amazing videos on YouTube. They're a group of sea nomads that live uh, on islands close to the Philippines that are able to basically free dive with oh, no yeah, equipment yeah. and hold their breath for like easily for like several minutes to fish. And their spleens are different and, you know, professional like Western divers have gone out there to study them because what they're able to do was thought to be impossible without equipment and they can just easily do it. Yeah. My only question with that would be, is this a result of repeated diving or are they born that way? Which mm -hmm. in which case it would be evolved difference. Right. I suspect it is an evolved difference. But you, you, you could tell just by looking at the newborns and seeing if they have the same kinds of differences as the adults do. And I suspect they do. Right. So that, of course, would be a recent evolution. Humans um, <clears throat> didn't get to that area of the world until not that long ago. So that's another example. Um, if you want, I mean, we can see evolution actually occurring in the last hundred years, if you want to get really picky about it. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the Framingham Heart Study in which they followed generations of humans, three or four, that's all you can do in about 50 or 60 years. You can actually see changes in um, various traits that are correlated with reproductive success. So we can actually predict that, yes, this is evolution going on in our species right now, but it's kind of boring evolution. <laughs> what we find out is that people are um, more resistant to hypertension than they were before. In terms of reproduction, we know that genetically women are coming into reproductive condition, i.e. getting their first periods younger than they used to, and that's genetic. And also the women are remaining reproductive, i.e. attaining menopause later, longer than they used to. And we can show that these various conditions are correlated with the number of offspring that they leave. So we can predict where the human species is. I'm always asked this question when I lecture, mm -hmm. where are we going? Are we gonna become a, you know, a species of super people? Are we gonna get handsomer? Are we gonna get smarter? Yeah. And, my answer is always, well, I just can't tell you because it takes a lot of work. 
the Framingham Art Study is a lot of work. You have to follow people for generations and follow the number of offspring they have and measure their conditions and stuff. So all I can say is that what's likely to happen is we're going to become more resistant to heart disease. Women are going to become reproductive earlier and they're going to give up reproduction later. And that's where, where how we know where we're going. There's other all kinds of other changes going on that we don't know about. We're probably becoming resistant to environmental toxins, for example. You know, as global warming proceeds, um, we'll probably be people that are more heat resistant for various reasons are going to leave more offspring and we'll evolve in that direction. But in order to actually see that happening, evolution is slow and we're a species that has a long generation of time. So it's you know, predicting what's going to happen is hard. So there's a, there's a theory, uh, which is put forth by people like, I mean, to some extent, Eric Kaufman and Simone Collins and and Malcolm Collins, which is when you look at differences in birth rates between very religious or conservative populations and secular populations worldwide, there just like is this huge disparity where religious people are having far more babies and, you know, pretty much everyone else isn't. And even without religion, just conservative people are having more babies than, than secular liberal people in many societies. And to the extent that politics are to some degree heritable or that the like attrition rate out of uh, religious communities is slower than that birth rate difference that we, we may just be getting slowly but measurably more conservative and religious as especially in Western societies. I mean, do, do you put any stock in that kind of a possibility? Well, I know that, that political leanings are heritable to some extent. You're right about that. And if there is a huge outpouring of babies from conservatives versus liberals, yeah, that would in general be a form of evolutionary change. But of course, it would be much slower than the kind of evolutionary change wreaked by politic changes in politics, for example, you know, that are not genetic. The arrival of somebody like Donald Trump, for example, can unfortunately just, you know, create huge changes in, uh, in conservatism that have nothing to do with genetics at all. And it's much, that is much, I mean, the fact is cultural change sort of via memes, is much faster than genetic change in humans. Now, in terms of religiousness, I don't, I'm not sure there is a heritability for religiosity. I mean, I know that they've demonstrated a heritability for being tendency to be liberal or conservative. Um, there's twin studies and other studies like that. I'm not sure we've demonstrated that for religiosity. If you, so, if you take for a... Example, yeah. Sorry? Sorry? I'm just saying, if you t- take like a test case like Israel where and I know you've written about Israel t- to some extent but there's a there is a feeling that the the Haredi population used to be really small but their their birth rate is you know the ultra uh, uh, orthodox their birth rate has been so high that they are now um you know a really significant part of the population just by birth rate trends alone and it looks like that has had an actual influence at this point on the direction of Israeli politics, right? Oh, yeah. I wouldn't deny that. Unfortunately, Haredi women are regarded as breeders like mm. cows are. And so they pop these kids at a huge rates, and that's going to change things. Um, I think Muslims tend to favor having more children than, for example, Jews. Or Christians, that's going to affect the demographics of religiosity. But I don't, I mean, being a Jew or being a Muslim are not genetic traits. You know? mm-hmm. What's genetic is the, your willingness to absorb the religion of your parents. I mean, that's adaptive for us to learn from our parents because that's how we survive in this world. We do what our parents have taught us through experience. And so that that's religion piggybacks on that. If our parents are Christian, we can, I mean, the, the, the trait with the highest heritability, there's two traits in the world that have the highest heritability of any other traits. The first one is religious 
leaning on the second one is wealth. But neither of those really have anything to do with genetics. They have to do with cultural inheritance. You get the money that your parents leave you. You get the religion that your parents teach you. So this is a form of cultural evolution. How it's going to be affected, but how it's going to affect the human gene pool, I would regard that as not a question of overweening interest compared to the cultural influences that can cause like, similar changes. So um, this is a very uh, hot topic in the culture right now, hot button issue, how we should think about sex and gender. Um, as, as an evolutionary biologist, if you look out on the landscape now, we're having, you know, constant culture war issues about the ability to change your sex, sex about transgender identity, uh, gender dysphoria in minors and in adults, whether trans people should be able to use the bathroom of their choosing of the gender that they identify as, or of their you know, what their chromosomes would say their sex are. And people have very heated uh, disagreements about this. Uh, I know this is something that you think about. How do you think about this issue of, of um, a dimorphic species like humans, which largely come in two flavors, encountering the, the desire for gender to be a spectrum and to be fluid and to identify differently than than how your biology would would dictate how do you think about this issue well first i excuse me i point out you said we're a dimorphic species which is true that dimorphic means two forms so you already have admitted that you recognize that there are two sexes males and females which it happens to be the case that you know this is a hot that's another it's the first issue we take up in this paper, the, the, the denial of, of the sexual binary in humans by ideologues. And I, I've been, just got in a big fight with this, this guy, Augustine Fuentes, he's an anthropology professor at Princeton, who wrote a scientific American op-eds basically denying that there is a sexual binary. And there's a whole lot of people that claim that sex is a social construct, something that's just artificially created by humans. It's nothing real. And they're all wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For years, biologists have recognized that there's two sexes, males and females, and they're defined as males are the group. And this is just not just true of humans. It's true of all animal species and most vascular plants. Males are defined as the group of animals or plants whose reproductive apparatus is designed to produce small, highly mobile gametes, sperm in animals, and there's also sperm in plants that do the same thing. And females are the group that are designed to produce, whose reproductive apparatus is designed to produce large, immobile gametes, eggs or ovo, ovules in plants. And that's all that we, that's all we got. <laughs> there's no third sex. There's no fourth sex. Sometimes you can have both sexes in the same body, as in hermaphrodites. I've never yet found a hermaphrodite in humans going through the literature in which both male and female functions fun work. There's a case of one hermaphrodite who could produce sperm that could fertilize eggs even though he also had ov tissue for ovules, but it wasn't functional. And we have another case of a, a, a hermaphrodite that got pregnant so that she functioned as a woman, but her um, reprodu male reproductive parts didn't function. So <clears throat> hermaphrodites are not, even if their both parts were functional, and in many animals, there are, like worms, there are hermaphrodites in which both parts are functional. That doesn't deny the sexual binary. There's nothing in the definition of sex that says that both sexes can't be co-occur in the same body. That's, you know, um, so, and they're so rare in humans. I mean, the number of individuals that do not fall into clearly distinguished males and females as defined by gamete size is 0.018%. Point zero, it's not 1%, it's 0.018%. That's about one individual out of 5,600 do not fit into the neat 
male, female spectrum. And that, I mean, that's as close to a binary as you could get. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, so it's, it's, it's people, biology. I mean, if I'm, I'm, there may be people listening to this thinking like, who actually thinks this, right? Who actually thinks that they're, they're, that the presence of intersex people or her, hermaphrodites means we're not dimorphic. Well, I mean, the, I, I, t- I took a class in college where this was taught as, as basically fact. And, you know, to me, it always seemed like, well, there are babies born with six fingers, but that doesn't mean it's not true yeah. that human beings tend to have two hands with five fingers each. Right. Yeah. It, it, like how far do we go with, with um, the rare exception, just uh, destroying the rule that's true 99 point something percent of the time. I mean, it's, it's clearly motivated reasoning and it's done by, by people that uh, obviously they have an ideology, which is, which we yes. should talk about, which is um, that they, they've, you know, people have gender dysphoria, you know, some number of people have gender dysphoria. They want to present as uh, the other sex to people they want, uh, to, to to be seen as a woman if they were born male or or seen as a, ma- a man if they were born a woman. By the way, that and, admits of a sex binary right there. Yes. So they, they turn uh, although, I mean, although increasingly there are people that want to identify as neither, right? They yeah. want to be called they, they. They feel that they are outside of the gender binary. And this is... Yes. So far as I can tell, it's just an irreducible, unanalyzable feeling, right? It's just like a brute feeling for people. And, um, and so the question is, what do you do, right? What, how, how, what, how, what does such a person do in that instance? How should society see them? Um, you know, like the, these are questions like we can, I think we can admit that biological sex is a binary and still we have not solved or answered every interesting question about how to, how, how to deal with this phenomenon of people having a strong feeling that they are um, gender dysphoric. So what do you, what, what do you, uh, how do you think about that issue? Well, you don't, I mean, the fact is you don't draw your morals from biology. That's one of the lessons of the paper we're writing. I mean, it's a clear, it's called the naturalistic fallacy that what is natural is good or what is natural is desirable. You, I mean, you don't do that. If you start down that road, then you're starting to, you're going to have to justify things like infanticide, rape, theft, any, everything that you can see in the animal kingdom. So, you know, how we, the fact that there are, that sex is a binary in animals and we're an animal is a brute fact. Now, what do we do with that? I don't think it, has much to say about the social socio-political attitudes towards people that are transgender or transsexual. And I want to make this caveat because people often insist that if you say that you believe in a binary sex, you're transphobic. You want, in fact, Augustine Fuentes says this in his article, that we want to erase this whole class of people from society, that we're somehow favoring genocide of people that don't identify as male and female. That's crazy. I mean, you know, just because you you recognize that there are males and females does not mean that we have to start killing people that don't identify that way. I have every sympathy in the world for people that go for through gender dysphoria. It's got to be painful. Every teenager has, you know, various psychological issues, and some of them present as gender dysphoria. Um, so I guess my view on this, which I've written about repeatedly, is that people that, well, first of all, if you're trans, there's a difference between, you know, being gay and being transsexual. <laughs> and one of them, you remain a sex that you are, but your sexual attraction is towards members of the same sex. And the other case, you are taking steps to try to resemble the other sex physically and maybe mentally. And the biological basis for that is in the offing now, there are people who claim that you can identify possible transsexual tendencies or gender dysphoria by looking at people's brains. And I haven't looked closely enough at that literature to know whether that's the case or not. But in terms of the moral and legal equality of people, 
I don't see why your sexual identity should have anything to do with that, except, <laughs> and there are several cases, you mentioned some. The bathroom case, that doesn't worry me too much because I've used unisex bathrooms so long. We have some in our department here that if they have stalls, I don't really care <laughs> who's, you know, doing their business in the same place. In terms I, of I locker have, room, I, I did, uh, I've, I've used unisex bathrooms too. I mean, my only caveat to that would be, I think as men, we would almost by definition have nothing to fear from unisex bathrooms. If but women do. Yeah. If, yeah. If anyone had something to fear, it would be, it would be women, right? Yeah. So that's, I would, that's right. yeah. I would in that way sort of take the lead from women more so on that on that issue. Yeah. To some you extent, make a good point. I mean, there's, there certainly should be bathrooms for men only and women only and unisex bathrooms. You can't, shouldn't just have unisex bathrooms. So women should be able to feel free to go into a woman only bathroom. But the problem there, of course, is that what do you mean by woman? I mean, the, the mantra of the gender activist is that a transsexual trans woman is a woman. So they should be able to use women's rooms. Um, that's why these sort of laws and rules have come up. And I can see some sense in them. But it gets much more serious to me with in sports, where the view that trans women are women does not lead to manifest unfairness against biological women. There's a reason why there are men's sports and women's sports, and that's because on average, a man who goes through male puberty even if he transitions later to being a transsexual woman, will still have an athletic advantage over biological women. So that's why, you know, they're separated. When puberty of a male causes a development of bone density and muscles and grip strength and various characteristics that give them an athletic advantage. So if you were to have men and women competing against each other in a single league, it would just cause all kinds of hell. First of all, in most sports, the women would just be knocked out of contention completely. Just like the, I think a bike race yesterday or the other day was won by a transsexual woman, a woman's bike race. Leah Thomas in swimming, who's a, identifies as a woman, but has the um, reproductive system, as I understand it, of a male, has become a champion, even though she was mediocre when she competed as a male. So I think it's completely unfair to allow transsexual women to compete against biological women. Um, and that's where I draw the line in terms of treatment. Well, bathrooms, you can make a case, and I could possibly agree with part of that. Certainly changing rooms, locker rooms. I mean, a woman does not feel comfortable taking her clothes off in front of a guy who identifies as a woman that has a penis. I mean, they've said that, and I can respect that. So, you know, that's one of the byproducts, of course, of having trans people compete in sports. Now, in terms of transgender men competing against biological men, I don't see that as a serious problem because I don't think it's unfair to biological men athletically. A trans man is going to have gone through puberty as a woman, and she's going to come off with less musculature, less bone density, et cetera. She's not going to be that competitive against biological males. On the other hand, world rugby has just outlawed trans men from competing against biological men because the women, biological women who are identified as men, trans men, are more liable to get hurt because mm -hmm. they're smaller and they're more fragile and their bones are less dense. So no, women aren't biological women who identify as men, transsexual. Interesting though that that seems that that's that seems strange to me because <laughs> they're if they want to play rugby in that league, then they're sort of signing up for the possibility of they're making that conscious <clears throat> choice, just like an MMA fighter, you know, is is going to choose to get into the ring, and he he doesn't care, he or she doesn't care if. They get their head pounded in, and that's kind of a choice we seem to allow people to make in most cases. Yeah, I guess it's just on an average, your chances of being hurt are higher. Um, in general, I don't. I mean, then there's a lot of sports where you're not going to get hurt, like archery <laughs> or you know, long distance running, and, and those kinds of. I mean, it's sports dependent. Mm -hmm. um, 
in some sports, I've heard that like shooting and uh, hyper marathoning, women, um, biological women are as good as biological men in competing. And there you might want to change the rules. It's sport specific. And that's what the Olympics says rule mm -hmm. that each sport has to make its own rules about which kinds of people are met. But in general, most sports involve advantages in strength. Um, musculature and density, and in those sports, I think, uh, I think it's fair to prevent or outlaw um, transsexual women who transition after puberty mm -hmm. to participate in those sports. Now, that's because it's unfair to biological women. However, it's also unfair to trans people who want to um, participate in sports, which leaves us with a conundrum. Well, what do we do? Do we just tell them, well, sorry, you can't compete? Do we tell them you can compete against the man, biological man, like you suggested? Well, maybe. Should we have another classification? Men, women's, men's sports, women's sports, and others? <laughs> That's possible, but it, it seems somewhat stigmatizing to be competing in other leagues. So the problem of what to do with, in, in particular, with transgender women sorry, transsexual women, um, is, uh, is one that's very hard to resolve. The Olympics used to use testosterone levels as whether or not you could compete as a woman. If your T was too high, you couldn't do it. But now they recognize that regardless of your testosterone level, you're still going to have a musculature, bone density, strength advantage that doesn't go away your whole life practically mm -hmm. if you're a transsexual woman. And so therefore, the Olympics basically threw up its hands. They got rid of these limits and said, okay, every sport, you guys make your own rules, mm -hmm. which just throws the problem onto any number of sports. You know, but in terms of just stuff like changing rooms, sports, and maybe bathrooms, oh, and not, rape counseling is another one, and home and shelters and prisons. I forgot to mention this. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's fair to put a sexual predator, for example, who is a biological male and, de and decides to identify as a female. And you you got to remember that in most of these laws, you don't have to have any medical treatment or surgery mm -hmm. to be recognized as a woman if you're born as a man. All I have to do is say, I feel like I'm a woman. Mm -hmm. I identify as a woman. So you can take a perfectly equipped biological man, and a lot of these have been convicted of sex crimes, and throw them in a prison with women, but with biological women, and you get sometimes the expected result, you know, violence mm -hmm. and rape. Mm -hmm. that should, that's unfair, mm -hmm. and I don't think that should be allowed either. You know, they've dealt with this in the UK now. Um, Scotland tried it, but the UK overruled that, so they can't do that anymore. Prisons, rape counseling, a lot of women feel uncomfortable being counseled by a biological male mm -hmm. who identifies as a female mm -hmm. after they've been raped, simply because they don't feel, and I can see this as justified, that not having had the experience of being a woman, you don't have the psychology to be able to help a woman who's traumatized in the same way as, you know, mm -hmm. a, a biological woman has. Mm -hmm. So those are the few, but that's, that's just a few exceptions. That doesn't, I mean, making these rules or guidelines does not by any sense erase transgender or transsexual people from society. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean we look down on them. It just means we're trying to strike a balance between fairness between different groups. Mm -hmm. And this is where we come down. In terms of everything else, your legal rights, your right to housing, you know, medical care, everything else like that. I don't think that gender or sexuality should make any difference whatsoever. Yeah. And I certainly, you know, would if somebody wants to be called a woman, it's like a transgender woman, I'll be happy to do that. Um, it's just a matter of civility and respect. Uh, yeah. to me. That's pretty much exactly where I come down on the issue too. So I'll ask you one last question before I let you go. What are the most important unanswered questions in evolution? Oh, uh, that's a good one. Well, one of them is, you know, where are we going? That's not going to be answered in our lifetimes. I mean, we'll know hundreds of generations from now how we've evolved. 
how sexual selection works is a very, I mean, there's a lot of people working on that, but we don't know on what basis females choose mates in general. We do sometimes, but why and how and what they're looking for in particular, I mean, is something that we don't know and it's hard to tell. Another unanswered question is why is there sex in the first place? If I were to butt off a copy of myself like uh, hydras do, little jerrys grow out of my arms and legs, I would leave twice as many copies of my genes as I would if I had to copulate with a female to have an offspring, which is the way it is. So actually there's a cost of sex, a twofold cost, which means that there's a big mystery about why organisms reproduce sexually in the first place. Mm. Now, there are suggestions about that, you know, having to do with gene recombination or putting together better combination of genes or getting rid of bad combination of genes. But we really don't know the answer to that one either. So, um, you know, I think those are the biggest problems afflicting the field. And there's a number of more arcane problems that are not of such widespread interest. But mm. Those are the big ones I would see. Oh, another one. This doesn't really fall into the ambit of evolution, but it's a problem that some people consider evolutionary. It's where life came from in the first place. Where did the first living organism, the so-called last universal common ancestor, the LUCA, that's the ancestor of all of us, how did that form? Mm -hmm. Was it the DNA or RNA first, or was proteins first, or was it a combination of them? We don't know, and that's something that we, I don't – well, we know that it's probably based on RNA rather than DNA, but where it formed, some people think in the hot thermal vents in the Pacific. Other people say there's cold thermal vents in the Atlantic that would be salubrious for this. So, you know, we know when this happened. You know, it was about three billion years ago, three plus, but we don't know how it happened. And the problem is... We'll never know because we weren't there and these organisms would be soft bodied and would have, if they formed today, they would rapidly be eaten by something else. Mm -hmm. So it may be possible someday to recreate life in the laboratory under primitive earth conditions. Mm. That will show us that it could have happened, but we already know it did happen. <laughs> but it, it might give us a hint on the things that make it are favorable for the origin of life. The problem is that's a damn hard experiment to do. Mm -hmm. you know? so. All right, Jerry Coyne, thanks so much. Sure. All right. That's it for this episode of Conversations with Coleman, guys. As always, thanks for watching. And feel free to tell me what you think by reviewing the podcast, commenting on social media, or sending me an email. To check out my other social media platforms, click the cards you see on screen. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time. Thank you.